Uh, I'm Claudia Holland, Chief of the Bureau of Library Development and the Division of Library and Information Services. Um, if you have not identified yourself, would you please um, put in your name in the chat as well as what library you're affiliated with? That would be great. Uh, and if you're feeling anything other than frustrated that we're late, uh, would you also share just one word talk, uh, indicating how you feel today? All right. Um, as we announced, this is the first in a series of four open online discussions that we're holding in May and June. We hope that uh, if you come to these sessions that you're willing uh, and feel comfortable in sharing your ideas, your concerns, and your plans as libraries begin opening up, up throughout Florida. And you may already be open. Um, I know that several libraries in the state are. These sessions really are for you. Uh, so we want you to feel um, ready to share. Uh, I just want to mention a few housekeeping items before we get started. We've muted everyone at this point, but we'll unmute you once the discussion begins. If you would please mute yourself until you're ready to talk, that would be great. Chat is available and we'll be monitoring it for questions you'd like to pose to the group. If you get dropped or are having bandwidth issues, please turn off your webcam if you have it on. And I do hope you will use your webcam because it does make it a little more personal. Um, and it, even uh, if you want to speak, just turn on your webcam then, or if you don't feel like sharing your image, I get it. Um, just go ahead and start talking. Uh, this session will be recorded and the link will be made available on our continuing education webpage for you and for others who are unable to join us today. So let's get started. Um, I want to just kick a question out there to, to get the juices flowing. Um, so knowing what you know today, what would you have done differently before March? to prepare you for your library closing. Amy Dickinson says she would have won the lottery. <laughs> I'll you there. I love that. So, Amy, I would have liked to have won the lottery too, but I think I have to play the lottery to win the lottery. So, uh, I do know someone who did win the lottery, though, big time. Anyway, I just want to throw the question out again. Knowing what you know today, what would you have done differently before March? And I think all of our lives change, you know, beginning of March, mid-March. What would you have done before March that would prepare you for your library closing? Hi, this is Amy Dickinson. Can you hear me? Yes. Hey, Amy. Hi. Um, so in our circumstance, I don't know that we would have done a lot of things differently, but I would have tried to ensure that I had a better source of technology for my employees, as most of them have had to work remotely. And sometimes where we are, it can be kind of spotty as to what they have. So trying to ensure that they had better access themselves to technology, um, ensuring that those those factors were in place, I think is one of the things we would have tried. Uh huh. Did you uh, have enough um, equipment for for your staff? Um, oddly enough, 
No, um, we had some very outdated laptops. And even though the city itself had purchased quite a few laptops recently, um, they weren't made available to our staff members. We had um, tablets available, but they really didn't meet the needs of the city because of security protocols they need to have placed on them for access that way. So it's been very limited for my staff, even from the aspect of just phones. Uh -huh. So, yeah. Now, Amy, what uh, library are you with? Uh, with the Riviera Beach Public Library. Okay. Yeah, um, I know that one of the things that we did uh, was had people download and make sure that we had VPN access. Um, I think we're all sort of getting used to using a smaller screen, <laughs> uh, which is kind of a challenge, but at least we did have some laptops um, to be able to distribute. Um, yeah, I think for smaller libraries too, I mean, I don't, to be honest, I don't know how big your library is, but for smaller libraries, I think it's a challenge to have that equipment, um, depending on, you know, what level of service you are going to continue uh, during, uh, the, you know, the time when people were teleworking. What kind of services were y'all providing during the, uh, you know, the closure? Um, very limited at this point. Um, we're still providing access to all of our online resources and essentially just acting as an information source. Um, one of the local county libraries around us has been very good about providing um, the unemployment application forms outside of their businesses. And I believe that some of the other entities close by to us had originally started with um, the kind of drive up book delivery programs, but some of them actually had to stop because of COVID exposure concerns. Mm -hmm. So for us, it's really been just providing online access, making sure people have active cards, um, and just making sure that the phone lines are always answered and trying to provide them resources mm -hmm. in the community. Because where we are, there's a very large digital divide. And so one of the biggest challenges our patrons encounter is having access just to print something or fax something. It's a, it's a real challenge. Down there. Yeah, yeah. So um, how, you know, did you just um, discover new ways of doing business in terms of, in other words, um, what did you, uh, you know, what did you do first? What did you do? Uh, how did you, uh, reach out to your public initially? For us, we've, we've done the social media aspects, you know, the Twitter, the Facebook, those kind of things. But really, our community is one of those that in previous surveys we found they really are a flyer community. Mm -hmm. So um, in we have a lot of events like food distribution events and COVID testing sites. We found that trying to provide information, throwing it in the box of food or handing it to them with the information for testing, that that is actually one of the best resources for us at the moment for getting the information out there. Mm -hmm. um, we did try mass email blasts and, and really had very limited responses for those items too. Um, so for us, it's really flyers and word of mouth and yeah. just trying to, when people call us and we give them the information, just kind of saying, hey, tell your friends, you know? So yeah. that's really yeah. what we're dealing with. Now, as you open up, are you, um, are you hearing from staff in terms of what concerns they have and um, how are you addressing those concerns? I'm sorry, Amy, I'm kind of picking on you because, <laughs> uh, but I, you know, it's really good to hear something uh, from a local standpoint as to what uh, concerns that you're having and what your staff are saying to you about when you're opening up and, and what, you know, how are you going to handle that essentially? Well, actually, that's why I, wanted to come on this platform and have kind of an open discussion because we're in a we're in a bit of an unusual situation that we have a bit of a facility issue 
um, with our library. So as to when exactly we will have access to the facility, again, is a little unknown at this time. Mm -hmm. um, there's potential for us reopening in phase two. Um, we're part of Palm Beach County, so we just mm -hmm. recently got on board with Governor DeSantis's order to kind of ease those restrictions, and we're kind of coming in a week later than what he's allowing for the rest of the county. Um, but I was very curious to hear how some of my colleagues out there are going to be braving the reintroduction of patrons into the library, what standards they're going to have and how they're going to measure it, um, even from, we had before this started, had blocked off certain areas of the computers to ensure for social distancing and, you know, we're potentially looking into those kind of large sneeze guard items and trying to um, focus on ways that we can protect our employees with the knowledge that PPE is going to be a standard work attire item at yeah. this point for mm -hmm. some time now. Um, but as to how you monitor how many people come into the library and how you still make that an enjoyable experience for them, um, not just one of necessity. I was very anxious to hear how some of my colleagues were kind of braving that effort. So um, I'm going to <clears throat> ask my staff. I have staff who are also on this uh, call, and we have all you know had our ears to the ground in terms of what libraries are doing. Um, and this may be something that you already know about, but uh, one thing that people are doing is uh, reorganizing their furniture. They're moving uh, furniture, um, I guess, into corners of you know, their, their space so that there's not an area to congregate or um, they may be spacing furniture you know, obviously, um, you know, not allowing people to sit right next to each other if you have like a, a, um, a line of computer stations, uh, you know, that kind of thing. So um, that's one thing that I understand people are talking about. Um, also, um, there's been some kind of back and forth about uh, taking the temperature of um, patrons who are coming in the doors. Um, you know, there's some concern about uh, whether um, they want to have that kind of connection with people um, or whether, you know, that then becomes kind of a health privacy issue. Um, I don't know if you've heard more about that as well. Uh, do you all? Have you thought about that too, Amy? We are actually doing employee screening right now for city employees who are considered essential and are required to be on site. Um, and I know that, that we've, because I've even had to participate in this, I know that there's been some serious pushback from some of the employees who are rightly concerned about, you know, their health information being protected and uh -huh. and what have you. Um, but I guess one of the concerns that I've had with that kind of screening is taking someone's temperature is not, they're saying now, if, as, as I've recently heard, that it's not one of the best indicators for if this is a situation where exposure can happen because uh -huh. We're still on that mentality down here that 80% of the population can be asymptomatic. And, you know, so it's, you still have great potential to have exposure, even if someone's not exhibiting any symptoms. Mm -hmm. um, so I know that they've even considered, like, I believe some court systems have the system where it's an infrared technology and you walk in and they can immediately tell if you have a temperature or what have you. But um, we're not, trust me, we're not that technologically advanced at this point. <laughs> How much is that going to cost? You know, exactly. <laughs> we can't even get the, the thermostat gun to work half the time. So, <laughs> <laughs> oh dear, challenge. You know, and some people but, have trouble if they have you know uh, targets on their books, and you know the the uh, door uh, thing is not working. And oh my gosh, yeah, yeah. So, that could be a challenge. Uh, how about far? You said you had you had moved some. You were moving some, uh, or at least taping distances off, and so on. Um, what about moving furniture? Have you thought about that as well? I think one of the things that we've had to really do is just completely take away the opportunity for people to 
going to lounge in certain areas. Um, they taped off furniture upstairs and and downstairs as well. Um, and we've, we, like I said, we kind of blocked off certain computer stations, but unless you remove chairs at those stations, sometimes patrons just have the tendency to grab a chair and sit right next to somebody, mm -hmm. you know, as well. So um, I guess one of the things that I'm concerned about as a librarian is the policing aspect yeah. of it. Right. And I feel that that is, not that it's not a situation that's not my job, but it's, it's more of a, you know, that's going to be really hard to maneuver and it's not something we're, we're really used to. Mm -hmm. And just figuring out how to make it known to patrons that really we're doing this for your safety and that yeah. people aren't as offended by its potential, so. Right, yeah, and signage is good, but it's only so good, <laughs> you know, and um, yeah, I, I, it's a tough situation in terms of um, do you leave it up to the patron to ask some, you know, someone who's too close or whatever to please move away, or do you just, get up and move yourself or uh, whatever. Uh, and I'm, I'm, uh, I've been thinking too about, um, I don't know if you have a homeless situation in your library or, you know, in your community, um, but you know, what, what, how, how libraries will handle that as well. Um, yeah, I just, I, I don't know. I, I, I think you're, your um, uh, your staff, if they're not used to policing, that's going to be a tough, tough one. Um, how do you think you should handle that with them in terms of you know just having that conversation and getting pushback from them? What what are you thinking about? Well, I mean, I'm always a big proponent of any kind of training and I really don't think that it's appropriate to push employees into a completely new job requirement for them without mm -hmm. them having potential training because then we also run into an issue of you know you need to make sure to do this so it doesn't look like there's bias so that you don't look like you know you're just being mean or what have you. We do have a rather extensive homeless circumstance, um, especially since one of the the homeless shelters that is around us, they shut down a few mm. months ago. So we had a, a very large influx into the library and into the general area for us. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think policing, that's one of those things I'd love to see a webinar on. And I don't know if it's something where we kind of pull from the resource of the Ryan Dowds of the world with the training that way and, and learning how to approach people and being non-threatening and, mm -hmm. you know, um, I think signage, I would love to say signage helps, but the problem with libraries is that we have a sign for everything. Yeah. So it can be a little inundating for people to sit there and try to read that, you know, every corner there's something and you just kind of numb yourself out to it. Right. Yeah, and even something on the front door. I mean, you you, you want to provide a welcoming environment, but then if you <laughs> you know you have this sign on your front door, uh, sort of laying the groundwork, if you will, that's 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 difficult um, to provide sort of that welcoming environment. Um, I, I don't know how that you're going to avoid that. Um, uh, other than perhaps also having something in the local newspaper, you know, sort of encouraging best practices. Um, you know, I think that's what libraries are going to tend to do is create um, uh, best practices on how, how we deal with something like this, um, not only now, but in the future. Um, it's it's something that we're we're whether we like it or not we're being forced to to uh, learn and um, learn how to handle now and in the future. Um, I see that Emily has a question for you. Will you be requiring masks of staff or the public? 
Yes, we definitely will be requiring masks of um, our staff just for, um, and that's another thing that we've had to kind of alert our staff to that, you know, the purchase and procurement of PPE is now going to be a standard item. So it's it's finding suppliers for those items to ensure that you have adequate amounts on hand, not only for us, but we have, we have guards in place and we have volunteers and um, so ensuring that we have that around. My understanding thus far mm -hmm. is I believe that they're gonna require the public to wear masks. I think it's part, I haven't, read the most recent decree kind of thing, but I think it's still in Palm Beach County that if you want to enter a business mm -hmm. at this time, they are strongly, you know, recommending, if not requiring, that you have a mask on. Mm -hmm. uh, but staff most definitely will be required to wear masks mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for their security. Yeah, so will you be encouraging that of your patrons as well? Absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've, I've been on, quite a few of these lines of food distributions and screening and handing out masks and those kind of things. And I can assure you that breathing through a N95 surgical mask, it is a hard thing to do. And Lord help you if you got glasses, you just better be able to <laughs> navigate Yay. the world blind. Amen. <laughs> it's pretty hard. But yeah, you definitely, you know, it's very hard to adjust to. And um, so it's going to be uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And but I absolutely, the staff for their own safety need to do it. Yeah, oh, yeah, I agree. Now, are you also putting? Are you planning to put up some sort of plexiglass between, you know, like at your reference desk or circulation desk, where, wherever you have um, staff who are dealing directly with patrons? I I would love to do that. Um, it's the issue of procuring it at this point. Yeah. And again, we're kind of in a situation we don't know when we're going to be open to the public again. But I firmly agree that we need to have some kind of a barrier there mm -hmm. to help with that. And um, I mean, I think it's great whenever I go to the store and I see it, I feel safer as a consumer, you know, seeing that glass there. Mm -hmm. um, so. I I think it would be good. The only problem I've noticed with masks, though, is it's very hard to hear people. So I agree. Yeah. So when you're dealing with older populations, too, even if you're, you know, really kind of loud and chant, it's still there's this muffling effect that can be limiting. And, and as a result, you have to lean in to tell people. So it kind of defeats the purpose. <laughs> defeats the purpose. <laughs> so unless I have some kind of an iPad with me with massive 72 font saying, you know, please hand me your library card on it for them to read, um, <laughs> that might be some, another issue that we're going to run into. Yeah. You know, I was noticing too that we don't, I don't think we realize how much really our whole face conveys communication. And uh, I've had the same experience where I, I can't, I can't really tell what people, you know, uh, not only can I not hear quite well if they're behind plexiglass and have a mask on, but I can't really tell what their emotion is, you know, what, what are, what are they saying? And what, how are they? What do they mean? Does that make sense? Um, Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I, I found myself smiling at everybody that went through my line. I'm like, they can't see this. Why am I doing this? You know? So, well, they can see your eyes. I think you yeah. can tell a little bit about the fact that they're, that, you know, it's better to have a smiling in your, smile in your eyes than complete dead, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, bland sort of. Uh, I'm, I'm hopeful that people can, can see that. In fact, I was talking to someone yesterday about this and they said that there are masks that are being made that shows your mouth so that people can, you know, I mean, right. especially for the elderly, for, they kind of read your lips too. <laughs> and for hearing impaired, um, yeah. I've yeah, seen that. Yeah. 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 It's, it's very interesting uh, to see what people are coming up with. Um, Anyway, uh, I, I want to hear from you what uh, 
what can the division do to help you uh, and other libraries that you're most familiar with? What can we do to help you as you transition into this period? Um, you know, uh, we're here to, to help serve and um, support libraries and, uh, you know, having the conversations is just a beginning. We kind of felt like the beginning conversation would be kind of maybe low attendance, um, pro pro hopefully not this low, but sorry. Uh, but as we continue these, I think that we'll have more attendance so that you will learn more from other people. Um, we could even step this up to every week if you think that would be helpful. But what can we do that would be in support of you and your library? Um, I think just kind of the standard areas of, so for instance, when we first started, I saw a CDC um, presentation on quarantining materials and what the mm -hmm. standards would be for that, for how long that should happen. If that changes, you know, to have that as a resource um, for myself and my staff, to have a, a, a location where we could go and check to see if there is just standard items being addressed, um, whether it's on the web page saying, this is how you quarantine materials, this is how you ensure, you know, paperback versus, um, you know, glossy paper versus audiovisual materials. These are the time periods for them. Um, and to, to kind of get the communication again going with the other libraries as to what their practices are going to be with social yeah. distancing. How many people are they going to allow in the library? Is it dependent upon the square footage of their library? Mm -hmm. Is it dependent upon are they opening their conference rooms up or are they keeping them closed? Are they doing face-to-face -face programming or is it still digital? Um, and of course, we're in Palm Beach County, so we are one of the, the top three that mm -hmm. have the highest exposure so it could be very different for us than say yeah. somebody in Lee or you know um, but having those resources and just saying that I don't have to have my staff come to me and say hey Amy what are we going to do about this person they want to renew their card or that kind of thing well mm -hmm. you know or something where it's like an exposure thing and I can say always use this as a resource you know this is current yeah. up to date. Okay that's good to know thank you so much and that is something that we uh, are working on currently um, to provide to libraries, sort of as a, I guess you would call it a clearinghouse. Is that sort of what you're thinking of in terms of um, quarantining materials and and sort of best practices um, yeah, across the like board? Yeah, essentially a lib guide for COVID for libraries. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Um, uh, we, I have uh, heard quite a bit about um, quarantining materials from a broad perspective. Um, some, some people are doing as little as 24 hours. Others, the standard seems to be three days. Um, I, uh, so, I think anywhere between the 24 hours and the three days. Now, again, like you said, it depends on the material of that particular print, let's talk print item, you know, with uh, paperbacks having more, you know, I don't know what you would call it, rough or, um, uh, what's the word? Um, uh, moisture, <laughs> you know, absorbent. it absorbs, it, it's more absorbent. Uh, material, I guess, than a glossy book, like you were saying. Uh, yeah, um, is this the same sort of thing you've been hearing as well? Uh, 24 hours versus three days? Yeah, I did hear that it differed on the the actual materials that were being yeah. used. And initially, mm -hmm. if I'm remembering correctly, they were saying that the the more soft surface materials they weren't as concerned about because it's harder for the virus to leave a soft surface and uh -huh. again that's i'm pulling that from my memory so i i can't give you the exact you know reference on that but um okay. but other things too like um are you allowing people to go into the snacks are you allowing them to go yeah. into books are you, you allowing the children to go in there and grab a book and you know get it out of their mouth before they get that 
lovely corner they love to chew on that kind of thing so yeah. are you restricting access that way mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Nice. and if not okay. how are you ensuring that those items are cleaned because you know we can't necessarily have a fogger go in there every day just for yeah. the expense it's amazing the expense of cleaning with covid that we're finding it's it's comparable to um our human capital cost in some instances mm -hmm. so um uh, are you, uh, I, i'm not sure if you're aware uh but uh that the um uh, division will be administering cares act funds and one of the areas that that would certainly be um considered i think uh, as part of this um of the application process is is cleaning uh, so, um, please keep your eye peeled on that information. Um, I, um, I think that, that libraries should be considering how they can uh, tap into this source of funding for um, uh, um, uh, what's the word? Um, not materials, but not only cleaning materials, but also long-term uh, technical solutions to to cleaning and to sanitizing uh, books, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so these are the kinds of, of uh, projects and that that would be considered uh, uh, a, 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 an, an efficient way to handle materials. Uh, is um, responding to COVID-19 uh, um, challenges that uh, are I'm not articulating this very well, but are handling um, materials in their libraries. How can they effectively clean those materials, sanitize them so that their public feel safer? Um, Marion, are you on this? Um, uh, chat, I think she's on. Yes, I am. Um, would you mind talking a little bit about that, the CARES Act funding, uh, and how Amy might be able to tap into that? Well, uh, sure. Um, we are in the process right now of developing the application for it. Um, we are you if it's funded you would have through september 30 2021 to expend the funds and there's basically we're still developing pretty much everything with it um but we've yeah, been I put, I put you on the spot sorry marian <laughs> yeah we've been awarded uh over uh 1.9 million dollars uh in funding um and we will uh be doing a call for grants but basically the cares is how do you how do you support activities and um, either reopening, getting open, staying open, and implementing services that may not have been um, traditionally provided or how to provide them remotely, what have you? It's pretty going to be pretty wide open, I think. Um, we're trying to make it as flexible as we can. So the different things you've been talking about, Angie, Amy, would probably um, be potential funding things. Yes. Thank you, Marian. Uh, does that sound of interest to you, Amy? Yeah, most definitely. Um, especially, yeah, because we'd really like to be as proactive as we can with this. And I'm, you know, just to ensure that everything's been covered, that we haven't missed any areas, not only for the protection of our workers, but the last thing we want is for somebody to get a contaminated item and to, yeah. to yeah. run the risk of that. So definitely mm -hmm. something right about the only thing that would not be allowable is it falls under it'll be fun using basically our rules for lsta funding about the only thing you would not would not be eligible would be uh construction and some of the state unallowable type things such as food which really wouldn't apply here anyway but uh, different things like that would be uh, should be eligible i would think so marion would items like ppe be eligible yeah. for this? okay i would assume so yes okay of course, so, there's the related challenges that we're hearing from a lot of folks is, um, can you get PPE right now? But that's a different issue, especially since you have through September 30 of 21 to expend the money. But that is a, another consideration I'm hearing from people. Yeah, actually, this brings up another 
question I have is, for instance, and in asking us about if we're going to be requiring members of the public to have masks. Um, what I don't know if you've heard from other libraries, but what are they doing in instances where their members of the public have not been able to acquire PPE or ha can't afford to have the PPE? Are they supplying PPE in those instances? Because I'd hate to have any kind of a circumstance where somebody's being denied entry to a library. Right. I think that libraries are um, actually offering uh, masks, for example, when uh, people come into uh, their library. So that would be something that you would want to make available to them. I think um, if you're if you're encouraging, obviously, people to wear a mask, then then in my opinion, you should have those masks available. Um, but again. The question is supply and demand. How do how do we ensure that people have access to uh, buying those materials? Uh, I'm hoping that that won't be as big a challenge as as it seems to be. Um, so, does anyone else have anything they would like to add about that on my staff? No. Um, one thing I wanted to ask you too, once you do open, or even before you open, um, uh, uh, one of uh, our my staff, um, Casey Shiley, is going to be doing some a, some webinars and chats on uh, LIP or uh, youth programs, summer reading programs. Um, how have you thought about how you're going to handle any any virtual programming, uh, Amy? Um, I've actually involved our children's librarian in that aspect because she's part the party who normally handles the majority of the summer reading program items. Um, she's been involved in some webinars so far and discussing about what they were potentially doing. Mm -hmm. um, we run into a little bit of an issue with digital um, in that our our systems were on the way of being upgraded, but of course this happened, so we didn't quite get the upgrade pushed through. We were transitioning from for certain computers from 7 to 10, Windows 7 to 10, those kind of mm -hmm. things. Um, and of course we run into, with our area, the digital divide because we are in yeah. a lower income area and there's certainly limited access to um, any programming we would have for our patrons. So it's not something that we're totally dismissing in any way, but we also want to be as inclusive as possible. Mm -hmm. um, and due to our extensive digital divide issues, it's we don't want to have just that limitation. So it might be a hybrid of those things. Mm -hmm. um, and it may be more like homework related items as opposed to you coming to see an event, you getting materials or what have you. So they're still in the planning stages of it. Um, mm -hmm. They had originally planned for the normal, but they're they're reviewing their other options at this point. Yeah. Well, I hope that you'll be able to attend, or your, you know, staff member who handles that will be able to attend to attend um, Casey's presentation or the the uh, brainstorming sessions that she's having. Um, Casey, would you mind putting in that information um, into the chat so that we have that for others who might be interested as well? Um, Thank you. She's going to add that in, Amy, in case you haven't seen that. Um, here is a question from another, uh, from Emily. Are you offering parking lot Wi-Fi? So yes. Okay. So Absolutely. are people taking advantage of that? We haven't seen that many. Um, mm -hmm. Because our parking lot is a municipal complex, mm -hmm. so we have had some people come in there. We have some people just kind of hang outside, um, but I have not seen that many, but we still leave it active at all times for anybody who's in the vicinity to use it. Great. Um, are you partnering with a lot of uh, local organizations to perhaps purchase PPE or to 
um, you know, uh, get the word out about the services that you, you can provide. Um, you know, what kind of partnerships do you have or would you consider um, developing to, in order to help you at this time? We um, we have our MLC Cephalin done here, so we we have a lot of committees associated with that, and they're excellent on training right. and really great with webinars and having a lot of active community boards and what have you. In regards to PPE, we actually normally get that through our procurement department, mm -hmm. and they they've done a really excellent job, I have to say, in securing materials. Great. Moving forward, they're going to assist us greatly in ensuring that we have um, reliable resources for getting this these materials. Mm -hmm. And I think that probably through Cephalin, we would be willing to assist or help our other libraries around us who may not have the resources we have or mm -hmm may even guide us to better resources ourselves. So we rely pretty heavily on Cephalin right now. Okay, great. That's a good that information. Uh, yeah. Yeah. We we as you know, we support uh the MLCs throughout the state and it's really good to hear that they're uh and I you know we see how uh integral they are to in helping libraries um not only when times are good, but when times are, are really challenging. And I agree that the uh, training has been awesome, uh, provided by both, by all of uh, the um, uh, MLCs. Um, uh, in particular, there have been some uh, really good ones by Plan and by um, Cephalin. And I, you know, I think everyone is stepping up to the plate, which is great um, to hear. And just Go on ahead. a a total side note of this, also Swiftland, yeah. um, we of course get to access them. They've had great resources on mental health during uh -huh. this Good. pandemic. And um, I, that's been a real relief to see, to have that as access for our employees and learning you know, for them to see how to do that. I had an employee the other day who told me how they took one of those those webinars and how they found it to be really helpful and just coping with being alone right now mm -hmm. in the, the oh. pandemic so um that's you know, wonderful you, yeah that's been a wonderful resource for us too oh great great um is there anything else would anyone like to add anything else um to share with amy okay uh i'm gonna uh give you back four minutes <laughs> of your time Amy, it's about 10 Thank you. Is there anything? Just uh, enough please, time to go buy a lotto ticket, right? <laughs> yeah, right. There you go. <laughs> uh, please let us know what we can do to assist you in any way um, or, or the other libraries in your immediate area or anyone who you're talking with who, who seems to be struggling. Uh, we are here to help. Uh, we want to be um, to provide you anything that we can in order to make this time, this transition in particular, um, as smooth as possible. Um, and, you know, just don't hesitate to reach out to us, okay? Thank you. Yeah, you all are always been really helpful and great, so we appreciate you. Thank you. And if you would get the word out on your end, if you think this was worthwhile to you and you would, excuse me, like to see others participate, please share the um, information. We'll be uh, putting it out, you know, every week uh, to remind people that the week after, you know, we'll be, we'll be meeting. So n our next meeting is May the 26th uh, at 10 o'clock, which is the day after Memorial Day. Um, so we hope to see you back then. Sounds great. Thank you, Amy. Yep. Take care. You too. Bye-bye. Okay, we're done. Okay, so.